This is the Dreadful Podcast from TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Lovecraft Country Season 1, Episode 3, Holy Ghost. The body parts that were found in what is now my basement, it took all night, but I was able to find all eight faces. Lucy, Anarcha, Grover. Color folks who disappeared on the south side. Now restless souls trapped in my house with their killer. They want out. I know it. <sighs> Uncle George would reference a haunted house story right now that proves that these ghosts are going to stop till you join them on the other side. I think it's time to move out. Welcome back, fellow Dreadfuls. Yes, this is the Dreadful Podcast. And, dare I say it, let us pray for the Holy Ghost, the third installment of Season 1 of Lovecraft Country. Uh, Yes, we're on TV Podcast Industries, and I am one of your hosts, John. I am one of your other hosts, Derek. It's only when you said it's Episode 3 and it's called the Holy Ghost that I went, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's the third one. Every person. It is. And we should have said, I'm one of your Holy Ghosts, John. (laughs) We should have said, I'm one of your Holy Ghosts, Derek. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Just to fulfill the supernaturally... Uh, mystery horror element <laughs> of the dreadful podcast oh and what an episode we have this week we're gonna go spoiler filled straight from the off of this one um boss have to say this one really felt like something from american horror story one of the really good episodes of american horror story felt like we had a horror house here so uh, well we have had this discussion mm-hmm. derek believes this is potentially turning out like an anthology well, series kind of and i'm not entirely sure yet i have to yeah. wait for the other episodes to come because simply because of that whole connective tissue back to episodes one and two mm-hmm. uh, with the arrival of christine um Braithwaite there right at the end of the episode yeah. uh, with the gun being pointed at her by Atticus. So mm-hmm. yes, this is definitely a spoiler-filled discussion oh, well, because we've just spoiled the end of episode three for we're everyone. Supposed, when we say it's a spoiler-filled discussion, we're supposed to say go away, watch the episode and come <laughs> back. But I have a feeling you wouldn't have downloaded the episode or wouldn't start playing it without knowing uh, what it is. That's why we called it out at the beginning of the episode. But just to say, John, that doesn't negate it being an anthology series. No, I'm that talking is true. Stories within the Lovecraft country with these characters is what this felt like this That's episode. That's true. But there's definitely going to be connective tissue throughout the season. We'll talk about all of it as we go in. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do so over on tvpodcastindustries.com. Uh, where all of our main podcast feed is. Uh, the reason why you'd subscribe over there is because we've got loads of stuff going on over there. Uh, we're just covering uh, Lovecraft Country on the Dreadful Podcast at dreadfulpodcast.com. Um, you can get all of our coverage of that and the coverage that we did of, of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. But if you want all of our coverage for all of our podcasts, pop on over to TV Podcast Industries because we have our wrap-up of Season 2 of Umbrella Academy, a show that we covered over the course of about three weeks. Uh, so you can get our wrap-up and uh, we'll be giving out our prize for the winner of our uh, pub quiz over over there for um, our Umbrella Academy uh, Season 2 coverage. We also will be beginning later on this week. The Boys is returning to Amazon Prime and we'll be covering the first three episodes of that show. The show's releasing the first three episodes next Friday. Um, and then new episodes every week uh, from then on until they finish off their season in yes, October. We will be uh, joining our fellow boys and girls mm-hmm. uh, at that moment uh, as we deep dive into our discussion and spoiler-filled uh, look at The Boys Season 2. Yeah. So, yeah, looking forward to that. It'll be fun covering both shows. I didn't think about it when we started covering this show. This show is 10 episodes long. The Boys is 8 episodes long. And actually, you know, even though we started the show before The Boys got released, we're actually going to be finishing it after The Boys. So... Lovecraft Country's going to be overarching on top of the boys. What a great antithesis to Lovecraft Country, having the comedy kind of setting of the boys, the ultra-violence of the boys, alongside the uber-horror, and not as much comedy, a lot more serious kind of oh, uh, insight to uh, to Lovecraft Country. So 
as a bookend on either side of the spectrum of TV shows, I think the two of them will work quite well together over in TV podcast industries. <laughs> yes, that is one hell of an interesting bookend Good fun. for sure. Good fun. But as Derek said, you can head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com. You can subscribe on any good or evil podcast catcher of your choice. Mm -hmm. We're over on Spotify. We're over on Google Podcasts. We're on over on Apple Podcasts. You name it. You can check us out there. Rate us, uh, subscribe, leave a review. Uh, it is very much appreciated, yeah. uh, all that support, because uh, supporting the podcast is, of course, sharing the love, uh, yeah. as we say. And if you want to, you can also support us over on Patreon. Uh, head on over to patreon.com forward slash TV podcast industries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to share any thoughts about any of our shows, any of the episodes we cover, any of the shows we cover, email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. We'll incorporate the feedback in the next episode after we receive it. Or if it's if the show is well gone and you're just catching up on something that we've done in the past, like Daredevil or Jessica Jones or Gotham or anything like that, and you just want to sh send on your thoughts to us, email us to that email address and we'll definitely reply to you as well. Love getting emails in from everybody. And another great way to send in feedback is through uh, reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd just like to thank uh, over on Apple Podcasts, our first review for Dreadful Podcast, actually, from um, a listener, Lizno. Uh, Five-star review. So thank you so, so much. Um, there you go. If you're looking for an informative and entertaining podcast, this one will truly fit the bill. Oh. The hosts are not afraid to share their show theories as well as offer any insights they may have regarding each episode totally worth your time thank you so much lizno for those really nice words it's so good to get the feedback and um, certainly through reviews uh, as well as directly into our email it's it's really good to to get the feedback yeah. it's really nice thank you so much such nice feedback as well and uh, we are definitely unafraid to share our theories no matter how wildly <laughs> off the mark they'll be uh, we do love sharing our theories on the show as well uh, thanks so much and really good to get some reviews we don't get very many reviews on itunes uh, to be honest i think a lot of our listeners are over on spotify where you can't review the podcast but if you are on a podcast catcher or a podcast player that does support uh leaving reviews please rate us and review us sure why not if it takes a couple of minutes of your time we love it we love reading them and we'll definitely read them out in the podcast as well yeah exactly Supporting sharing the podcast is sharing the <laughs> frights uh, of horror. I indeed. love it. I love it. John putting on his Lovecraft radio voice there. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So with that, on to Holy Ghost, which is episode three of season one of Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. Derek, what are some of the episode details? Yep, the episode was directed by Daniel Sackheim. We spoke about him last episode and all the wonderful credits he's had in the past. Episode, once again, written by Misha Green. Uh, in the writer's room, we also have Jonathan I. Kidd and Sonia Winton, both writers for the show, uh, written uh, the episodes in the writer's room with uh, with Misha Green. Uh, this seems to be Misha Green's show. We we're getting the writing credit for, or the teleplay by Misha Green credit every episode. She's the showrunner of the show as well. So uh, very much her vision. Yeah, absolutely. So... um but it's good that um, the the other members of the writing team are, are given uh, the credit as course, well. So absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah, good stuff. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the HBO synopsis for the episode? Sure. Hoping to mend her relationship with her sister Ruby, Letty turns a ramshackle Victorian house on Chicago's north side into a boarding house, an endeavor that stokes neighborhood racism and awakens dormant spirits stuck in the house. Meanwhile, Atticus remains burdened by a guilty conscience as George's wife, Hippolyta, presses him for the full story of what happened in Arden. Once again, the terror and threat coming externally from normal, average, everyday, horrible humans and uh, and inside from uh, from the spirits of the dead. Um, yeah, I love this uh, this kind of balancing act they're doing with this season. They're really putting this stuff really well together uh, as what are the real threats going on in, in the time? And, you know, from scene to scene, the threat changes, really. So Absolutely. I, I, but I think what's really good about it is that it does show how much of horror is drawn from real life, mm -hmm. real life experiences or perceptions. And I think what's great about the show is that it marries the two of them. Um, because certainly with this Victorian house, this creepy house, this oh, yeah. hell house, you know, it, it really does, um, marry the two because, um, both internally within the walls of this house and within 
the externally with the neighborhood um it's pure horror it's um it's it's totally awful because i mean when you think about it certainly in terms of the neighborhood horror of the racism the intimidation mm-hmm. the harassment you just kind of think that's their home and you think of living in your own home and being subject to that and you just go what a bunch of absolute well F wits, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, like it makes your blood boil because you just think that's where you're supposed to be safe, mm-hmm. secure, uh, and it just causes absolute mayhem. And it, 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 yeah, it's just really good. I like how it marries the that supernatural horror with real life horror and actually showing that in a sense, they're both equally as bad because they frighten people. They're terrifying. And in some instances, just damn right out of order and awful oh, and so violent and everything else in between. I so I love how else. that's um, being done with with this show so mm-hmm. far, the marrying of those two, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, John, let's get into our kind of big moments and our things for discussion for the episode. I know you're going to kick us off first. Uh, I was just going to call it the speech at the beginning or the uh, the static screen that's at the beginning, but I know that's incorporated in your point. Do you want to kick us off with what you thought about the episode overall, the bits that you liked about it? Suppose. It really is. Uh, like, my kind of main big point here is pretty all-encompassing, but mm-hmm. I'm going to start off with the line pioneering is dangerous Mm -hmm. um and first off just in those few words uh, i love how that relates to letty her sister ruby and the borders uh, living there on uh, chicago's north side completely out of their comfort zone uh, in, in terms of the the neighborhood and just being subject to the abuse of their neighbors you know they are pioneers and it is dangerous for them uh because of those external threats and also because of that house and, and what lies within it. But I, I loved this whole twist for me, or at least it was a twist for me because mm-hmm. I have to own up here and um, how I was drawn in by, th- yes, that the, the text right at the beginning, which talks about how um, 10 people of color moved into a house on the north side of Chicago and 10 days later, three went missing. Uh, and, and in terms of my own short sightedness or, or being drawn into that, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it led me down a number of different paths or into several cubby holes, uh, closets um sellers to try and find the truth of what this episode was going to to be surprised at every turn and so for me there was a twist here uh fr- from the setup with that opening mm-hmm. uh few lines with the the countdown happening throughout the episode and this idea of the three people so i actually thought that lassie had moved into the house that they were referencing at the start Ah, okay Okay. and i kind of thought that the 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 disfigured and restless ghosts that we see we see that excellent one in the bedroom with just the hand reaching out Mm -hmm. uh, and the jaw ripped off we see the other one in the bathroom. Um, he certainly got a pretty, uh, he probably got a pretty big shock when Letty and Atticus decide to have, um, sort of a, a quickie in the bathroom. Uh-huh. But we, we see in that moment a, another one. And I kind of thought that initially that these were the three people that went missing that were still inhabiting the house, yeah. uh, haunting it, being restless spirits, wanting to kind of move on. Um, it's, yeah, it's a great choice by the writers here to do to put that up on screen at the start because I think it just puts you a little bit off on, or on edge uh, throughout the episode because you're kind of thinking, is this going to be Letty and our gang? Is it going to be some of the other people that moved in with her? Is it going to be some of the uh, the church community that she moves in later on? Is is it going to be the kids that are one of them is going to die or three of them are going to die? You know, there's so many moments within the episode where you're kind of thinking someone's going to die here. Is it one from each of those groups? But I do think you are taken taken aback by perhaps it's the three it's three of the neighbors that go missing in the house because just how it's written in there it's kind of three of them is what it feels like when it's not exactly. saying it doesn't no, say exactly. it three people went missing exactly. in the house but exactly. you you had an extra as you say you have an extra layer on that where you thought that this wording was about something that happened in the house. 10 years beforehand and they'd moved into the house where people had exactly been so i thought the countdown that was happening uh-huh. was actually 10 days till 
another three people were going to go missing right. out of uh, that could include Ruby and Letty. Yeah, uh, something that was going to happen to those. So th- I thought this was a countdown for something really bad yeah. happening to the people who had moved in. Good bit of extra um, tension there. Like. No, absolutely. <laughs> I uh, think uh, you weren't tense enough watching the show. I, w- I watch the show with John every yeah. time. Uh, there's a moment early on in the episode when the lift dropped for the first time, and that yeah. was the first scream uh, from John uh, on the couch beside me. Uh, as, this as we was really it, so, uh, spooky. I, uh-huh. I kind of really like Haunted House. These are your favourite uh, genre, really. Yeah, yeah, I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, Hell House by uh, Richard Matheson is mm-hmm. one of my favourites. I love that aspect to it. And even, uh, you know, moving through these, these genres, um, you know, we have the haunted house, the hell house, this idea of poltergeist mm-hmm. as well, uh, with the whole seance, uh, being conducted by their friends, which I loved the fact that they slaughter, um, a goat uh, on the veranda of oh, the yeah. house. Sorry. And, um, you know, to remove these evil spirits, these restless spirits that's, you know, I think they are thinking that these are spirits that want to move on, yeah. which they absolutely are. But of course, there is another big spirit in the house, which is far more menacing um, and is trying to keep them mm-hmm. there, really, uh, because the, the, those people um, who uh, those missing people, um, it was it was ultimately um, the three white uh, men who had been harassing them throughout this episode yep. with the horns and um, with the the burning cross in, in the front lawn um, and I, I really kind of thought this was um, just so good and, and just that whole seance aspect where it finally became revealed that they were removing this this racist surgeon or doctor who had been experimenting with missing people from the south side of chicago or kidnapped people which is or, what it seems like yeah or yeah. kidnapped people because I, um, I think when they read out the news story about what happened with him they kind of alight in the fact that he was friends with certain people in the town who uh, effectively one of the police chiefs who was a, a decorated officer yet he was providing victims for this guy to experiment on it's the way that letty's pieced the story together that there's two very influential white people in town who are supplying yeah. uh, experimental subjects for this scientist i want to say is that the right word for someone or that, surgeon that, yeah. or just general psychopath yeah that's um, what I'm to thinking. be honest yeah. and um i i thought that that seance and i think <laughs> in the end the letty calling upon her strength um along with the combined strength of the victims yeah i thought it was really nice them in the circle kind of chanting and their disfigured selves mm-hmm. which you know, it, I think the one that really stood out to me was the the big baseball uh, or or uh, basketball player with the baby's head on the top. John, I, I don't think that's going to be just you that that stood out to. That no. is the most weird of the lot because we see him early on when the two guys first go into the house and they're trapped in there. The two white guys uh, who get trapped in the house the first time. That's the first time we see this uh, basketball player, this monstrous body walking out of the darkness. And then as the camera pans up, you see the baby's head on top of it, kind of giggling like like a baby would kind of thing. And before that, but, they've just heard the baby giggling as well. Exactly. So they think there's a baby in the room. Yeah. And yeah, hey, presto, this this ghost materializes. And it is very distracting. It's almost a comedy moment uh, in that in that early part. But I think that's part of, you know, if you're trying to line up the victims that disappeared uh, with the number that's given at the start of the episode, you have, as you say, you have the older lady that's lost her jaw. You have the guy in the bathroom and you have this basketball player effectively and you kind of go maybe those are the three victims that had gone missing in the past so those you're lining up your numbers when you when it cuts to later on in this moment where you have the circle where they're uh, where they're trying to get rid of this demon surgeon effectively and their bodies start to rematerialize into what they what they used to be like it actually works much better but that moment early on i was kind of going uh oh this yeah. either the cgi here doesn't work or this is just too weird for the scene or it gave me a bit of a laugh when i thought i should be being scared by it but i suppose you're creeped out by the crying baby to begin with and then and then to have the scene afterwards but it probably relieves a bit of tension because the episode is very it's very scary it, it haunted, is. Ha- haunted house kind of episode it really so. is but yeah. I, I love that moment where they all come together and and letty as well and and their combined strength 
you know, of Letty, who has a really nice um moment actually with with Atticus, where she, um, yes, she does. you know, she says, "I found a different world, one that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it isn't what I thought it was." But she kind of has this inner strength to say, but I have to confront it and face it, even though I'm as scared as hell. Yeah. Um, and you see that with her using this strength to, to combat um, this malevolent, psychotic ghost of a former scientist who experimented on kidnapped uh, black people from the Chicago South Side. Yeah. And I love the fact that it's combined with his victims who expunge his malevolent ghost. Um, and it, it's just, I think, a really nice moment uh, that that happens. Uh, and that as they're doing it, their disfigured selves become their normal self exactly. again, which is really good, and they're able to move on. And in fact, the victims also exact their kind of force on these three white males who have been harassing Letty. Uh-huh. Um, and... They ultimately are the three missing people. And that's where it was like, that's really good for me. And that's because I had this whole different thing going on in my head as to what, what what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, I just thought this was really nice because this, this idea of the, the hell house, that the house is alive and that it's, or it has these malevolent ghosts, um, that can't move on or trapped within it sort of, you know, transposed with the, the horns going off and the police being called, the burning cross, the oh, harassment yeah. that they find is it, which is the same thing about this idea of being trapped from the outside by your neighbors mm-hmm. and trapped within by the, these malevolent spirits within or these restless spirits uh, of the victims was just really well done. I, I really, really liked it. So well um, structured, really, yeah. And, and one of the other things that, if you look at it from the other aspect of it, this is the whole thing about Letty's character. She is so strong because look at the shit she has to deal with in the regular outside world. Yeah, exactly. And when she's confronted with a supernatural situation, well, she's just as strong a woman because, again, look what she's had to put up with in her life. So while she is, I'm sure, terrified about what's going on, she's going... It's my house. And I love how she takes that power from the uh, the evil scientist, uh, the madcap scientist dude. Um, <clears throat> and I love how she takes the power from the evil surgeon. Effectively, he starts off with him as the ghost when she pieces the pictures together and it forms his face shouting, get out of my house to her um, as he eventually comes back to him, to his uh, his ghostly form and the whole circle are, are formed Letty's inspiring all of these people that they're not dead like they were from him. Take themselves back, become yourselves again, and do one last thing before you move on. Get rid of this man yeah. from my house. Well, get and, out of my house, as she says. Well, to him. and it's get out of my effing house. Absolutely, basically. Yeah. I love that she screams that uh, at him. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it's just um, I, I I love how it interchanges between these different. Uh, Aspects and of course, mm-hmm. what you find in that final scene where the lift goes down to what basement two, mm-hmm. uh, and you see this 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 cavern with lights or this tunnel with the three bodies of the white men who are still missing, and then loads of skeletons uh, throughout this tunnel. And the again, the other important thing is that these three white men are missing, yet all these eight victims, whilst reported, you know certainly on the north side that there's really little care for whether they will be found or are still missing right that's kind of what i felt by having this trail of, of skeletons throughout the and um, that that sort of dug out earthen cavern was yeah. that okay there's they're missing because they're white and on the north side yeah all these other skeletons that have been kidnapped or missing and probably have had very little attention from the Chicago police into their yeah. cases. Yeah, it was um, very much like when the when the police chief or the police officer uh, who brings Letty into prison or collects her that night, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but uh, when he brings her in, he talks to her about it and says, we found bits of body parts everywhere in the house. Um, 
we know that there were eight people downstairs in that basement kind of thing. And that's the eight people, I think, that formed the circle. I think if I, if I didn't count them, uh, unfortunately, should be doing due diligence in our podcast, John. <laughs> but I think it's eight people that are that form yeah. that circle. Um, and the whole point is that it's not just eight victims. That's just the eight body parts that have been found. And the police are willing to just leave it there because... They don't really care about the black exactly. people that have gone missing in the house. Yeah. So that's the rest of the victims that this person uh, must have killed and were taken from uh, from the streets in, in uh, South Chicago. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, the one thing I do need to point out is, you know, scariest room in your house is probably the cellar, if you have one, mm-hmm. or the attic. Well, this house has got an attic and it's got a cellar. Yeah. It also has a cellar of the cellar where Letty was doing her That's photography. Right. Yeah. And in fact, it's got three of these scary things because then it's got the cellar where all the bodies are kept. So basement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's three times the skirt with all these cellars. But I, I, I kind of, uh, I really thought um, yeah. this was a great haunted house, um, hell house uh, episode. Yeah. And I really liked it. And I even thought, you know, it's not just that because it's also actually about a serial killer house as well. Like you would see whether it's something like psycho esque mm-hmm. in that sense. It of, did look like the psycho house. Yeah, and it size. did yeah. exactly. And certainly with the disfigured victims, I really got a sense of the Island of Dr. Moreau Ooh, yeah, uh, yeah. with these disfigured test subjects in this case with humans yeah. rather than with animals. Do you know what I was thinking? I was thinking of um, Beetlejuice yeah. and kind of the Frighteners, the one that uh, Peter Jackson's one, I think he yeah. did, Michael J. Fox uh, had that kind of feeling about it, the kind of ghostly presences that look very different to humans because something's happened to their bodies uh, before their death effectively. So uh, it just, there's some moments where you're looking at the, the models that are there, the the um the CGI models of these people, and you and you start to you kind of look at it as a normal horror movie, and then for a second, at least for me anyway, it crossed my mind as to what happened to those people before they died to put them into this disfigured state, and then I didn't want to think about it anymore. You know, I, I was wondering, did he murder a baby and graft its head onto the body of the basketball player for whatever reason he he had? You know, the woman who had her her uh jaw smashed in he did that to her for what reason you know and i just didn't want to question anymore because there's some despicable things that must have been done to these people before their deaths and, and i thought it was really affecting me at that moment so i just stopped for a second i went right i'm just going to enjoy this as a horror scene for a minute and not think about what's going on in the past or what happened to these characters. Well, absolutely. I mean, he's just a psychopath. He's a a sadist um, as well. It's, it's, and there's enough in this show uh, of of actual real experiences that happened, rather than delving into, uh, into the supernatural uh, elements. Exactly. I mean, the other final point really for me on this is that, you know, the, the, the missing eight people, the, and as well, I initially thought were down to the racist neighborhood mm-hmm. with the harassment and the targeted uh, kind of attacks on them. Yeah. I thought that ultimately the way they drove out the, um, the, the, the people in that house was through this and ultimately killing three of them mm-hmm. a, a, as this warning. You know, you, you very much get that sense. I mean, a bit like as Christina says to Atticus right at the end, you know, you have to be smart about this. Pointing a gun at a white woman isn't going to get you very far. Yeah. And, and yeah. similar, I kind of thought that there was possibly some kind of threat that they follow through on. And it would be like, who would believe that we would do this? Absolutely. You know, but and right to the end there. And who would care is more the problem. It's well, not exactly. who would believe. It's, you know, it feels like, you know, early on in the, in the episode, where they've put the uh, the bricks on the car horns outside the house, you see the police car rolling on by and the two guys inside smiling. So they know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and you absolutely are supposed to feel at the end of the episode that if these three white guys get into the house, they're going to kill Atticus, the, um, the priestess, and uh, Letty in the basement. They're going to catch up with them and kill the three of them, and those are going to be the three victims. You're supposed to feel that when the three white guys go into the house, but it flips completely as yeah, the which was evil great. spirits take their revenge. Yeah. It was really great. And yeah. actually, yes, those eight missing people were not down to the racist neighborhood, but un- were unfortunately down to the racist, sadist, psychotic um experimenting doctor or whatever and the people who supplied the victims and the people that supplied the victims so this was kind of topsy-turvy for me i don't know how many people 
possibly came at it from this angle. Yeah. But for me, then I just loved these twists and turns within this episode. I yeah. thought it was uh, really excellent stuff. And again, just loved it. Yeah, that's really the central part of the episode, but there's still so much other bits and pieces that happened within it as well. You know, even just the possession of the priestess jumping to Atticus uh, yes. as, as, as this evil spirit is jumping between, between them, their guys going black and then speaking with his, with his voice, um, love, because it's, it's kind of a repeat of something that we see from earlier on in the episode as Letty took the photographs and saw the vision, the, the faces of the eight dead victims in the house. This time we see as Atticus is walking towards her, we see the face of, of the psychopath coming back and forth out of Atticus's head at the same time. I think it's really well done. It's really cool. Really liked it. Yeah. I, I think the other aspect of this is how Letty and Ruby, um, kind of deal with the racist neighbors. I love that they have a house party mm-hmm. that just causes so much noise. And I could imagine being at the house party going, this is causing our neighbors so much issue. They're going <laughs> to, it's, it's going to make them so hot and, and sweaty around the starch collars. And I just loved that kind kind of defiance of, of, of doing that and and even with the the burning cross on the front lawn oh. that she went out and went sodges and baseball bat to the the windows the lights to to get rid of the horns blurring uh, as well and I for days yeah days. And, she wakes up in the morning and hears, no. and hears them every day i absolutely love how the scene is taken care of by Letty and, and the people who live in the house, all of her friends taking care of it because it's so perfect. She gets her moment of triumph when she gets rid of the brick in each of the cars. She smashes the front window, back window, the front lights. Uh, these are the cars from the, of those three guys, effectively, that she's destroying outside of her house. And I love instantly is Ruby that's driving the car where she comes out. They open up the, the trunk of the car, the yeah. boot of the car. They throw in the uh, baseball bat. And she the has, guns because the Atticus yeah, the have all come out as well to yeah. protect her in case anything goes down. Yeah. Uh, but they hear the sirens and the, the car comes out. Everything goes into the boot. It's almost before they hear the sirens, though, is yeah, what it feels yeah. like. It. They know it's about to happen, but they want to make sure that Letty gets her moment. Stands up to everybody. And then what I really like, and it's just a little touch, that they throw the jacket over the top of Letty, so they hide the dress she's wearing, so that maybe that might make some of the people that think they know who it was that did the damage, maybe they'll question themselves. Maybe that might protect Letty a bit. Also could be because she's spending a night in jail and the dress doesn't look like uh, it'll keep her warm in jail, so they've thrown a jacket over Um also reminded me of the uh, of the fantastic James Brown clip where he's uh, being helped off stage and gets the gets the jacket thrown over his oh, shoulder yeah, to help yeah, him yeah. off. So it feels like this triumphant moment almost for her, just like it did for the wonderful James Brown. But there you go, loads of uh, little inspirations in that in those scenes. Uh, you mentioned the seance as well, the seance with the kids that uh, that was in that with was the, in Ouija the, episode, board. the Ouija board. Yeah, 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 that was just it's it's just it's such a staple of. Uh, 70s and 80s horror, horror movies, definitely. I, I know at this stage, I think most people know the Ouija board was a board game created by Parker Brothers, who did uh, who did Monopoly, didn't they? That's Parker Brothers, isn't it? Yeah, Trivial um, Pursuit, I think, as uh, well. Maybe, yeah. Uh, but they, it was effectively a board game that you would go to a shop and buy, a, a jokey board game about uh, talking to the dead kind of thing. But I love how it's used uh, in here because we've seen it so many times before, but the the four kids together using it, how terrified they yeah. are as it starts to move on its own. I love how all the kids just start getting completely freaked out as it spells out the words George is dead, specifically for poor D, her father who passed away a couple of weeks ago, effectively at this stage. There's a kind of a time jump of a couple of weeks uh, we hear in here, three weeks since his funeral, isn't it? Um, and D's in there thinking that they're all effectively attacking her because her father's passed away but uh, but they're saying it's the spirits in the house that are doing it you know yeah i like the the ouija board uh, aspect to this i actually thought i think were they down in the cellar or up in the uh, attic because we we later see hippolyta mm. going up to try and find the kids yeah with the because of the cross burning she, you know she wants to get them away from trouble and, and potential uh fights and and harm yeah but um we have that moment where she goes uh, and and looks up and I thought we were going to have some kind of attic scene as mm-hmm. well uh, but in the end the, the one of the bedroom doors just opens and there's there's this whole clockwork solar system uh in the middle of the room yeah. which is um 
kind of just didn't necessarily go anywhere, I have to say. I wasn't entirely sure what that meant uh, or whether it was something to do uh, with George because um, in this episode as well, uh, something we haven't maybe mentioned is there is the... um, there, there is the repercussions of George's death. We have the funeral at the start. We have, um, which is a very joyous one and very lively, but you know, you just have Letty the crying sat down, yeah. not really uh, participating. And of course, the, the, there's that kind of awkwardness with Atticus at Hippolyta's, um, home where mm-hmm. George lived. And, uh, you know, he says it himself. He's worn out his welcome and he's looking for somewhere else to stay. Yeah. So all of that is going on as well. And I just wondered if it was something to do uh, with George. Uh, but it, it it wasn't obvious to me, I have to say. Yeah. I will say probably this is one of the ones that we're going to have to watch this space and see what happens to that in the future. They're still in the house at the end of the episode, which means that that uh, diorama, I guess you call it, um, is still there. So uh, so we're probably going to see what that was in the future. But there's a couple of things, you know, it's, it's an episode of TV. You can't cover everything, but it feels like sometimes when you're putting your potential victims in uh, in scary situations, you got to come back and make sure that say they're okay. <laughs> and I felt with the kids and D while well, again, I absolutely loved the, the seance scene, the actual Ouija board scene. Well, I loved that as, you know, a great trope changed for this episode to put the kids in trouble. I really would have wanted to see them one more time in the episode to go, Oh no, they're fine. They've, they've already been taken home by one <laughs> yeah, of the friends exactly. of the family, you know, cause they got scared or something, you know, but it feel, felt like, um, that maybe they didn't need the scene, but it felt like, Everybody that's in the house is in trouble all the time. So, um, but I suppose part of the structure of the episode again was having the countdown to day 10 or the count up to day 10. So, uh, so you do skip things that are going on. You know, we, we hear just in dialogue from Ruby that everybody that had moved into the house originally, uh, the, all the artists that had moved in, all of, uh, all of, uh, Letty's friends, they've all moved out because they're not willing to stay in the scary house anymore with the creepy neighbors and or the crazy racist neighbors uh, and all the other things going on in the house. So um, so we're probably are skipping a few things because of the actual mechanism uh, of how the episode's told. But uh, I just felt I was kind of like, can somebody check on the children? Can somebody just confirm that Ruby found or that the Ruby found the children or that Eliza found the children? Somebody uh, tell me here because <laughs> because uh, it's a weird moment when Dee runs away from them. You're expecting that later in the episode she's going to be caught in one of the rooms or something with with a scary ghost uh you know what i mean that's what i was expecting yeah, to happen no, so. definitely but there you go um loads going on in there i love the party uh must say that looked like such a good good party i love anybody who sets up a band in their house uh to play music especially Absolutely. music as good as ruby's band like, yeah it was really good she is such a great singer absolutely fab i love that we've had we've had two live concerts from her effectively uh, in episode one and episode three now uh with two or three songs a beautiful voice really really good so uh so i love that but uh I don't think I'd get away with in, in my house or in our house having a having a house party where we had a full on band uh, going on in the house at all. We could have it at the bottom of the garden. Yeah, we have. We, we live in a suburb, so uh, no we just invite we the neighbours. Invite the neighbours. That's the one. Invite the neighbours. I wouldn't invite their neighbours though. No, not at all. <laughs> Let's go through some of the other things that happened in the episode um, that we may not have talked about. We talked a little bit about Montrose uh, in the episode, but uh, one of the things we kind of hear about the death of George is that they've explained it, saying the sheriff of that town killed um, George. That's how he died, and that Montrose and Atticus took care of the of the sheriff and got out of there effectively. That's the story they've been telling uh, Hippolyta. That's the story they've been telling uh, everybody else. So but she's known from the first moment they returned that that's not the truth of yeah. the story. She's um, got that nagging feeling. She says that something is not a right about George's yeah, death. Exactly. I think one of the things that you'd pr- probably get that we talked about a little bit before, you know, how scary George's life must have been if he's put the one writing the traveler's guide for America to make sure that everybody stays safe. All the, all, any black travelers that are traveling around America stay safe going to these areas he must have gotten himself into a lot of scary situations and gotten himself out of those before in order to not put them into the book effectively so that would probably make Hippolyta realize this is a man who can really take care of himself in terrorizing situations or terrifying situations so something 
deeper must have gone on. But there's also, again, this is a supernatural show with, uh, with a lot of spirituality in it. So potentially the connection between Hippolyte and her husband makes her go, I know there's something weird that happened there. Yeah, you're not exactly. Uh, nobody's on the level here, you know? And also Montrose having like seven bottles of, of vodka, uh, a day uh, since he got back probably would be an indicator here. Well, for sure. I mean, Montrose is feeling George's death as, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting about the scene though with Montrose and Hippolyta because it's at, um, George's office, uh, where they do the, the travel guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's really something happens that's really weird. Um, with the sound as they're speaking, it's kind of the music goes and Something passes very quickly outside of the window uh, of George's business, mm-hmm. and if it wasn't for the music, I would ne- you would never be drawn to it. That's true. Um, in in the context of how the scene is set up and and, and the conversation between Montrose and Hippolyta, and I was just thinking, is that my imagination? Mm-hmm. Is this just a little nightmarish Easter egg that's chucked into just? play with your mind as <laughs> to whether that is the thing that's happening or is it possibly George or something else yeah. but certainly did, it, it's did something just, to uh, to watch out for yeah, just like did a kid run past the window at uh, that, that specific moment and they just decided to soundtrack it with scary music <laughs> it could be <laughs> or is it like the haunting of Hill House where if we go back and watch the series there's going to be loads of ghosts easter eggs in every single corner of every house uh, that we just didn't see because they're on the peripheral of our vision um, which was such a great touch in that show uh, really excited to see the second season of that coming back later on this year as well but uh, yeah, yeah another great haunted house uh, really tv one. series uh, really for good. sure yeah so it looks like at the end of the episode montrose seems like he's going to tell hippolyta about uh, how we lost george maybe might get that um he might be revealing that to hippolyta there uh, just another touch from her throughout the episode this frustration that she has at the loss to, at the loss of george and leaving her behind effectively um we see her taking it out on his copy of Dracula, uh, yeah. his, his favorite book, as she's been ripping out pages of it. Uh, and then we just see that little moment when she comes in with the uh, with her shopping and has a copy of of Dracula to replace George's copy. You know, this it's just little moments that, that you just kind of tell the relationship. We saw how strong the relationship was in episode one. We saw him calling her and saying that he wanted her to come on the road next time they went back out possibly an indicator that he wasn't coming back. I suppose if we were thinking about it like that at the time, I wasn't. Um, but but now we see that she's kind of hating him for being gone, but also loving the things she misses about him, of course, because she's going through that absolutely horrifying uh, feeling of of loss, I suppose. One of the other things we just need to talk about as well, you mentioned earlier on about Christina coming back at the end of the episode, but I suppose one of the big conversations that happens in the episode is really between Ruby and Letty uh, and how, how Letty got the money for the house. Um, yeah, that was an awkward conversation. Yeah, considering we've had... We've heard a lot about their mother being a deadbeat mom. We heard in the last episode Letty talking to um to Atticus about her mom and the fact that she left them both many times on their own when she'd disappear with pretty much any man that would take her home. And then suddenly Letty turns up with enough money to buy a house here. Um Ruby questioning it immediately and thinking, hang on a second, that couldn't possibly be our mom. And if she was going to leave anybody money, she'd leave me money, not you. Yeah, it, it did feel strange that Letty was buying this house. But mm-hmm. I I think that was another thing that fed into me believing that she was buying a house where there had been a lot of murders or this right. whole yep. thing of the three people missing right at the start was mm-hmm. that it, it was so cheap that Letty could afford to do it. And then there was this conversation between the two where in in telling Ruby that it was from an inheritance, it it sparks off the the sort of the underlying tension between these two sisters, which is money. Because we we as you say, seeing Letty asking for um accommodation uh, because all her money's gone and Ruby kind of being the sensible one yeah. who would look after her, and then Absolutely. all of a sudden finding out that she's bought this house, but also that their mother did have money, and she never told her about that. Like, yeah. she has, like, great moments. Says, even if it was mum's will that it went to you, that you didn't even think to share it with me, to split yeah. it between the two of us, and to tell me the truth 
uh, that you had this morning. Exactly, exactly. Actually, it wasn't split up between the two of us. I noticed something in the dialogue there, and I need to check it the next time I watch the episode. But Ruby says something about splitting it with her and a brother. So there's actually another member of the family that we haven't met yet, I think. Okay, I did not get yeah, that, I to, have to say. Need to check that. So let's just talk finally about Christina. So at the end of the episode, it, it is Atticus who realizes there's no way Letty could have possibly got this money from anywhere else other than from the Braithwaites uh, and their massive fortune. So Christina must be alive, right? So, uh, so yeah, and there was a, there was a hint to the Winthrop house yes. as well. And that's what gave the game away. And he goes to kill her effectively. Yes. She uh, manages to weave her magic to prevent him. And I loved that scene where you just have that single bead of sweat coming down uh, his cheek absolutely. as he's kind of been paralyzed by the spell of Christina. Yeah, absolutely. The clue that there was a connection between the uh, the Braithwaites and the uh, the horror house that uh, Letty's bought is that the, ha- the horror house is known as the Winthrop House. And Winthrop was one of the names that was on the painting that was shown to, uh, to Atticus, uh, before the ceremony in the last episode, uh, written on the painting was the name Winthrop and the name Braithwaite as well. So the family's in some way connected. So Atticus has pieced the whole bit together. Uh, very cool. Uh, interesting as well that, uh, that Atticus has a job in Florida that he's supposed to be getting back to. He's <laughs> yeah, been gone exactly. for a month, like, <laughs> yeah. And he did give the finger to, uh, to the whole of the South of America as he was leaving going up to Chicago. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so you're wondering whether, is that true, or was he actually just hoping that? Well, Letty he says was his something? boss only thought he was going to be gone for a week, yeah, and it's like four weeks later, exactly. Kind of thing. So, do you think he was, he was actually angling for Letty to let him stay in the house? Maybe. Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. I think certainly, so. what happened in the bathroom? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's certainly a lot of sexual tension between these two. Definitely, but it's it's a good sexual tension. I I think between the two, it does feel natural, and it doesn't feel like a horror trope even though the sexual tension between characters can very much be a horror trope i was actually thinking about that when we watched the episode john you know what i loved so much about this we find out that letty's a virgin she's had sex for the first time yes in horror house surrounded by ghosts and she isn't dead by the end that of the is, episode. Exactly. So it's the exact opposite of all the stupid tropes exactly, that's that we what I put mean. up with for 25 years. It, it's, it's playing on the trope, but it's not being the trope. Exactly. It's great. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, finally, have to mention, in Christina's speech to Atticus, when he's stuck, oh, yeah. uh, when he's stuck not being able to shoot her, not being able to move, beads of sweat falling down his face, um, Christina tells him all about the Book of Adam and the pages of the Book of Adam that she is now going out to seek like some kind of adventurer that she's like Indiana Jones, possibly. Um, this whole concept that the book of Adam is what has taught them all the magic that they know, all these amazing spells that can do amazing things and uh, do amazing damage. But what could happen if you put together all of the pages of the book of Adam and you learned the full language of the book yeah. of Adam? What kind of spells could you do then? Kind of thing. In, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's fascinating. So this, I think, is our tip of we started out our episode saying, I think it's going to be an anthology show in some sense, but I think this is the overarching story potentially Definitely. for at least the next couple of episodes. Christina going on her search for the pages of the Book of Adam while uh, while there's some horrific things going on in Lovecraft Country. Definitely, and I think also two of the things was that Atticus wasn't wearing the ring that he had from the last episode, so I was mm-hmm. looking out for that one. Uh, and also simply the fact that, yes, Christina Braithwaite got out of that crumbling Adam, uh, Sons of Adam Lodge yes. alive or managed to get out before then. So I was just wondering who else may be, maybe her friend, the, the butler, William, or whether, um, her friend who's a boy. The friend, the boyfriend. Friend who's a boy. The, the boyfriend. Friend who's a boy. The friend who's a boy. The boyfriend. <laughs> and, just whether with this magic she you know there's she's obviously using Atticus here yes, absolutely um will it be for good for evil or just simply to bring back her father Samuel um you know I, maybe th- mm. there's an element of that about yeah I don't this. think she I just, wants Samuel back I, I don't know you know so, like so where she's we... kind of been kind and considerate <laughs> to Atticus but she still upholds everything that subjugates him so yes. Unless through these adventures she has a change of heart and a change of mind, I'm not entirely sure that we're able to trust her. 
I'm still trusting my theory from last week that she gave the ring to Atticus and her power was in the ring to stop the ritual that was going on and kill Samuel, the person who has denied her her what she that believes true. rightful place at the center of this uh, of this whole society. If she gets all the pages and gets all the power, then she is right at the center of the society. That's and she true. doesn't need him back. She doesn't but need I'm, Samuel I'm, back. I'm still not on board with that theory. Okay. But I like it. Okay. I'll tell you another reason why I believe that that theory is true. Have you watched ahead? I haven't watched ahead. Of course not. I have been reading the book, though. Okay. (laughs) Christina's not in the book. Christina is uh, is actually um, Samuel's son uh, in the book, Um, but they have changed it to Christina for the show. So so that's different. But there's definitely a scene that happens that uh, is pointing in the direction of, uh, of my theory anyway. Great stuff. <laughs> but I haven't finished the book, so I, so I don't know for definite. Anyway, that is it, I think, for most of my notes uh, for the episode, most of my thoughts about the episode overall. What did you think of the episode, John? Any other, anything else you want to talk about? No, um, for me, I loved this episode. Um, I would give this five violently faulty lifts or elevators out <laughs> of five. Um, uh, a decapitating he- elevator. It, it oh, really yeah, was. So cool. um, hats off and heads off to this episode <laughs> for having this whole haunted house, hell house premise. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed it. And part of it was probably because whilst watching it, the way it was, I thought in my head it was going to turn out was turned on its head mm-hmm. uh, with the misdirection and everything else. And me sort of, sort of going down that rabbit warren of how I thought it was going to play out. And it was turned on its head and I thought it was great. And that's why I'm giving it five violently faulty lifts out of five. Excellent. Do you know how many times you said head in that section, John? Lots. I think, yeah, I think the loss of the head of one of the racist white guys <laughs> being hit by a lift is playing in your mind somehow. Let's just say I won't <laughs> be getting into a lift, uh, in the near future. It, it's creepy, isn't it? Inside it is. Head. I don't know that, that it's just such, so well put together. This, the set design as well for this, uh, made it work. I absolutely love this episode as well. I'm really looking forward to episode four. Um, what I'm so impressed with, I'm actually reading the book kind of alongside this, as I, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, and it does take a lot of the great parts from the book and just kind of gets rid of some of the other stuff or mashes together some of the other stuff uh, in a slightly different way. And I think this episode, particularly, um, compared to what I read in the book is much more tension filled than uh, than what I saw in there. So, uh, so they've done a great job of of turning this into a really good episode of the show. Uh, really excited to see next the next one and see what's going on. Yeah, I'm really go. looking forward to episode four now. But we have some uh, feedback through from uh, some of our listeners. Remember, uh, fellow dreadfuls, you can send in your thoughts on any of the episodes of Lovecraft Country to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Mm-hmm. You can join us over on our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries, or you can send in uh, audio playback through the email as well as going to our website, which is tvpodcastindustries.com uh, and leaving up to 90 seconds of your thoughts on the right hand side tab uh so yes absolutely yeah we're recording a little bit in advance at the moment uh, if you do want to send your thoughts we'll talk about them on the next episode uh that we're recording where we are going to be moving back to a, a more regular schedule after episode six i think it is uh we'll be go- going to uh episodes recording a little bit after the episodes come out uh really because we're going to be doing uh the boys and uh, and lovecraft country at the same time so we're just going to manage the timing on that but if you do want to send in any thoughts as john said email it to the email address there uh, we have some thoughts on episode two to begin with Yep, yeah, first up is a voicemail from Steve Brown on episode two. Hey, Derek and John, this is Steve, and this is for uh, Lovecraft Country episode two. Uh, just finished watching it uh, for the first time, and I feel like I could I could watch these episodes like three times, and I still wouldn't get it. So I'm so glad you guys are uh, podcasting because I, I mean, wow, uh, th- this episode in particular, uh, it's hard to pick uh, just a. a, a couple big moments but uh um gosh uh that whole sequence where he asked for their memories to be restored and she just did it i was like wow this this is weird spellage magic work in here and then uh of course that ending 
But uh, the, the biggest moment, really, for me, I will say, it took me several minutes to figure out who he was. But when we finally met Montrose and uh, I realized, I, going, I know that actor, I know that actor, I can't, can't pinpoint it. Where is he from? And finally, he said some line that struck me that he's Leonard from Happen Leonard. And I know he's done a bunch of other things as well, but Michael K. Williams uh, was amazing in Happen Leonard. If you uh, ever checked out that that series, I think there's like three seasons. It's him and uh, uh, oh, the name escapes me. The guy from uh, Knight's Tale. Um, it'll come to me after I finish this. But anyway, so Happen Leonard uh, is great, and, and Michael K. Williams. Uh, I, there's still eight episodes left. Where is this? Is this going to go? Now, are we going to go track down more of these lodges? Are these guys still going to co- be coming after uh, Atticus and his family? Oh, and that's the final thing that I'll wrap up with. I thought last week, I thought the last name was Foreman. It wasn't until this week that I realized, no, their last name is Freeman, like free man. thought that was so cool. All right. Can't wait to hear what you guys thought. Talk to you later. Thanks so much, Steve. So good to hear your feedback. I'm so glad you're enjoying the show as well. Um, you know, it's really dense. I think the amount of stuff they're putting in the episode, I think what we mentioned about episode two was it felt like an entire season squeezed into that episode and we had no idea where it was going to go. And what do you do? Well, you just do three weeks later. Um, here's another story. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's tie it back into the other episodes. There's still loads of stuff that we, uh, probably didn't realize that we didn't know, I suppose. So, uh, so thought that was kind of cool. Hap and Leonard is a show I have never, ever heard of. I wonder what channel it was on. Uh, cause I don't think it made it over to here in the UK, but, uh, the other person you were trying to think of was James Purfoy, the other person in the cast with Michael K. Williams. Um, we know Michael K. Williams from The Wire. He's probably, oh, absolutely. probably the biggest role for, for me, definitely. Good old Omar. Omar. Yeah. Uh, Omar's Great gone. in The Wire. Awesome. Absolutely cool. Uh, James Purfoy, we know from uh, Sex Education. He was the father in Sex Education. Yes. Uh, and he's going to be in Pennyworth Season 2, another show we'll be covering. Uh, weirdly, uh, not not anything like uh, Lovecraft Country, but uh, but looking forward to, to seeing what he's going to be bringing to that show. But I might have to, I have to check out Happen Leonard because I pretty much loved everything I've seen Michael K. Williams in. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Michael K. Williams, suppose, up until Lovecraft Country, uh, we've just seen When They See Us as well. He was one of the fathers of um, the Central Park Five, a uh, really tragic portrayal of uh, of a father mm-hmm. uh, in that um, in, in that four part series. Yeah. It w- it was just really really good. Yeah, he Michael K Williams is is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, I've loved him since The Wire, and yeah, really such a great great actor. So yeah, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, for for the feedback uh, and spellage, I will take that forward <laughs> from now on. I think I like that. Yeah, there's uh, there's so much magic in the episodes as well. You know, I think this is part of the thing that that people may not realize how much inspiration for. Uh, for science fiction and fantasy came from some of the Lovecraft books. You know, there, there were absolutely monsters, demons and magic involved in there, you know, but certain authors over the course of the, of the 20th century took elements of it and turned them into their own franchises. Not many of them combined them all in there. Um, so I think that's, that's partly what we're seeing here is this show is also taking some inspiration from some of the writings of Lovecraft. So to the show, it would make absolute sense to have magic in there. Um, but we're probably not as used to seeing magic on screen in such a grounded show as, uh, as this is. So it does come out, come as complete surprise. Uh, even, even in that first episode, we only saw really one instance of it, which was the car flipping, uh, the car that was chasing Atticus and, and Letty and George, uh, if flipping before it, before it hit Christina's car. And we were wondering what was that? Uh, the second episode, we actually see proper magic in place we see you know click of the fingers and something happens you know uh, that kind of stuff but as christina says if she gets the other pages from um, from adam's book yeah, what exactly. magic is coming then you know she can open the doors for cthulhu exactly what i was thinking <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we also got a bit of feedback over on twitter from will b who's a, a wonderful listener for the last couple of years to our to our podcast um he was totally shocked after episode two, but also pointed out, I'm near certain that was Tick's mother in the photograph. George, he says, I believe there was a photo of their family in the first episode. Unbelievable how much they can pack into each episode. I went back and had a check on, on the episode one. When Atticus goes, goes back to his father's apartment, he picks up a copy of the County Monte Cristo, which is uh, his father's favorite book. 
and the photo falls out of that. It's about the 25 minute mark of episode one. I went back myself, uh, definitely had a look at the uh, haircut and the dress uh, of the lady in the photograph. And is the looking who, rather similar. That's what George yeah, looks exactly. very, very similar. So it looks like uh, George may have had a relationship with uh, Atticus's mom. Yeah. And sure. Montrose's wife. Uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wilby. Mm-hmm. Um, also over on Twitter at the soul man, uh, pointed out that George pulled out a copy of the house on the borderland from his library of books in the Arden Lodge. The house on the borderland is a supernatural horror novel by uh, a British fantasist, William Hope Hodgson. And the novel is a, hallucinatory account of a recluse's stay at a remote house and his experiences of supernatural creatures and other worldly dimensions sounds familiar it really does <laughs> um and uh yes this was a novel that uh lovecraft uh praised at length and mm-hmm. certainly by the sounds of it has probably influenced um a number of writers indeed one of my favorite ones Richard Matheson mm-hmm. with Hell House. Yeah, um, it yeah. sounds very, very similar it does, it does. Uh, in some respects. So, yeah, yeah it's a good spot there at the Soul Man. Absolutely. Thanks, Soul Man. That was really cool uh, to, to see those kind of things. If you see anything else that's coming on the episode of anybody, any of our wonderful dreadfuls, sees anything else in the show that they want to point out, um, just the, the, it seems like it's filled to the brim with little references and little... Uh, touches to things that we may not notice on first viewing or second viewing uh, if you see anything that we haven't talked about email us to feedback at tv podcast industries.com uh, and we'll talk about it on the podcast thanks so much and thanks so much to everybody for joining us we hope you stay subscribed to the podcast and if you enjoy what you hear why not share it with your friends sharing the podcast is sharing the love see john i said it this time you certainly did <laughs> and in fact on the dreadful podcast Sharing the podcast is sharing the screaming That's true. <laughs> uh, and terror, uh, which is very good for me because uh, mm-hmm. I have a lot uh, that to really does need to be passed a- around for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. We will be back next week with Lovecraft Country Season 1, Episode 4. No, it doesn't contain um, the actor Viggo Mortensen, but it is called A History of Violence. Um, so, oh, yes. Nice. Let's see what happens here. God, that's a great film. Vika, Vika Mortensen. Awesome. Awesome in that film. Yeah. But, uh, but that's on our dreadful podcast. As I mentioned earlier on, we will be starting our coverage of The Boys on Amazon Prime with the first three episodes uh, of The Boys over in our main feed at tvpodcastindustries.com and also on The Boys podcast from TV Podcast Industries. Uh, I just subscribe to TV Podcast Industries instead of subscribing to the individual ones personally, but... That's because I know you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of all the shows we cover. Yes, I think so. (laughs) I think we can say that. I hope we can say that. (laughs) After 520 episodes, I think we can say that. Yeah, absolutely. God, it's only 504 episodes. Where am I getting? I'm I'm exaggerating again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think uh, on that note, uh, on that uh, scary note, I think it is time to say uh, goodbye to our fellow Dreadfuls. Yeah, Mm -hmm. thanks so much for joining us. As always, it is a pleasure to speak with you uh, on all things dreadful and all things Lovecraft country. Mm. Um, and importantly, keep watching, keep listening, and like Letty, keep, keep pioneering. Oh, keep pioneering. That's pretty good. I like that. I was ready to go keep screaming along with you. Well, that is... <laughs> that. Keep screaming is an unspoken... Okay truism for this podcast that's the general yes (laughs) i love it i love it thanks so much for joining us talk to you again next time bye bye